Hi everyone, welcome to today's special May the 4th edition of SEJ <laughs> with Kelsey Jones, Executive Editor of Search Engine Journal, and this is Lauren Baker, founder of SEJ Speaking. Hi Kelsey, how's it going? Good, you can call me Ray Jones today. I have my Ray buns in, I'm ready to go. Amazing, I had no idea they are <laughs> called Ray buns. I, that's my name for them, but yeah. So today, uh, Kelsey is going to be discussing how to create a galaxy of content through repurposing. And she's going to be running through a lot of great real-world examples um, from some of the projects she's worked on. We may even have some SEJ examples in here. And um, some great uh, slides to really teach everyone involved um, in today's SEJ Think Tank how to get the most out of your content by thinking a little bit outside of the box and not necessarily just creating posts or creating videos, but creating everything else that you can around that um, content um, and very efficiently as well. But uh, before we get started, uh, let me go through a little bit of housekeeping uh, just to let everyone know how uh, today's webinar will work in case you have not yet attended an SEJ think tank. So um, just to let you know, uh, you'll see a GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. Um, during the webinar itself, we will be uh, launching two polls and questionnaires. Um, if everyone could please answer those when they're launched, that gives us uh, some great data on um, basically our audience and really helps uh, Kelsey uh, craft her presentation. Also, um, the webinar itself will be about 30, 35, 40 minutes. Afterwards, we save time for Q&A. If you have questions that arise during uh, Kelsey's presentation, please enter them into the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll then pick out uh, the best questions um, to answer and have conversation around them. And we might even call out your name and hometown as well. Uh, the official hashtag uh, for the webinar is hashtag SEJ Think Tank. So be sure to let everyone know uh, on Twitter that you're currently uh, watching uh, Kelsey's uh, special May the 4th webinar. And then afterwards, uh, we'll also be having a survey that we're sending out to everyone. And before you log off, please fill out the survey. It helps us really plan our material and put together our awesome content calendar. Um, for future repurposing efforts as well. So um, that's basically it uh, in terms of uh, what we'll be doing with today's webinar. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Kels. Okay, great. Thanks, Lauren. So I want to talk a little bit about me before we get started. Um, I'm the executive editor at Search Engine Journal. My favorite Star Wars movie is Return of the Jedi, mostly because of the Ewoks. Um, I specialize mainly in content strategy and SEO, but I also have a background in code, WordPress, and social media. And I've worked with brands like Ford, Salesforce, Yelp, and Haywire. So I'm really excited to um, join you guys today to talk about content and how you can make the most of it. So in terms of repurposing content, that means how can you rework content you have into other pieces of content or other forms of media? So some of the best reasons I can think of is exposure to more audiences. So you know, maybe somebody's going to see a webinar you're doing about a core concept when they wouldn't have seen a blog post you wrote. Um, you know, the same ideas get used more, so that's less development time. So once you write a really great piece of content that you know you can turn it into other things, that's going to um, give you more time to actually work on creating the content versus spending more time in the development and ideation phase. And then finally, my favorite thing, expanding on topics you're excited about. So um, you're able to talk about topics that really make you interested and excited and that passion translates and comes through to your audience which I think really increases engagement level and return and and your audience will know you know what you're passionate about and what you want to tell them so before we get started I want to do our first poll to kind of get a lay of the land and figure out uh, where you guys are coming from and that'll help me shape my presentation so Lauren do you want to do the first poll Absolutely. <clears throat> so launching the first poll, everyone should see it pop up on your screen right now. Um, what other types of content do you use besides text? So please select one of the following. Uh, webinars, podcasts, video, or uh, no. Um, I don't do any of them, but I want to. So if everyone could take the time 
to uh, select one of these uh, multiple choice answers. It looks like we have about 66, 68 percent of you have voted already, so pretty amazing. Um, let's give it a couple more seconds to get up to the 80 percent mark and 76 percent. Come on. <laughs> one more vote. You can do it. 77 percent. All right, we're almost there, so I'll count down. Oh, 83 percent. Wow, that jumped up really quickly. Wow, that's a lot. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and close this in five, four, three, two, one. Closing the poll and sharing the results. So it looks like 13 percent of you um, also do webinars. 42 percent, a whopping 42 percent do video. Only 8 percent podcasting, and then 37 percent uh, do not currently repurpose your content, um, but want to do it right now. Anything uh, you can add from these results, Kels, before we get started with the rest of your presentation? Yeah, it's um, actually really good that you, a lot of you guys haven't done webinars and podcasts yet or anything because those, I, I mentioned those in the presentation. So, you know, video has become a lot more mainstream in terms of content creation. So I'm hoping that I can give you guys some ideas um, you know, with this presentation that maybe you haven't thought of in terms of expanding beyond video. So, awesome. Thank you guys for voting. Fantastic. Appreciate it. So, uh, before we get into the presentation, um, I, I really briefly want to say, too, if you like our webinars, you might also like our podcast. So, we do a weekly podcast every Friday. We have experts like Jay Baer, uh, Pam Didner is going to do one with us. I just recorded a podcast yesterday with Sally Hogshead. Um, all kinds of authors, and so that's the quick link. Danielle will put it in the chat box if you guys want to subscribe or listen. I just thought I'd mention it because it's another uh, type of format that we use at Search Engine Journal. So give it a listen. So let's get started. So today I thought it'd be really cool instead of just giving um, examples and main points to do a case study. So actually taking a real piece of content that exists out in the wild and coming up with ideas on how we can repurpose it. So we're going to use my blog, The Hustle Life. It's just a personal blog I have. It doesn't really get a lot of traffic, but I like to write. So I write about productivity, um, new workouts I'm trying, uh, book reviews, things like that. It earns like $5 a, a year in AdSense. So I write just um, things that don't fit in the marketing niche that I normally write about on there. So I did a piece of content, I believe it was earlier in April, and it was called, Are You Addicted to Potato Chip Tasks? So the idea of potato chip tasks come from the Productivity Project. It's a really good book by Chris Bailey. Um, it talks about how to be more productive. And so potato chip tasks are also known as junk food tasks. Um, I just call them potato chip tasks because that's my junk food of choice. But um, it's basically the idea that, you know, junk food tasks, which are, you know, things that might give you a little rush of adrenaline, but don't really move the needle a lot. So maybe checking email, checking social media mentions, um, responding to people on Facebook, um, you know, bookkeeping or, you know, organization of your desk. Things like that are little tasks that aren't really making the biggest difference in terms of your business. So if you want to compare that to your high quality tasks like projects that you need to get done, like for instance, a big project for me would have been finishing these webinar slides when they're due. That would have been way more important than a junk food task like checking my email because I had a deadline to finish the presentation. So I really liked this idea and I wrote a blog post about it um, just kind of explaining what it is and why uh, working on your potato chip task in the um, in the morning when you usually have the most energy actually hurts your productivity. So how can we take this thousand word blog post that I wrote on The Hustle Life and turn it into you know, the moons and stars in our content universe? So how can we expand on this um, content and turn it into other types of content? So let's go through it. So first, you, we could access outside knowledge. So think about, you know, I'm the expert in terms of writing that article, but there's tons of other places where we could get an other information. So, you know, the first thing that's probably a natural step is to interview the inspiration for the article. So in this case, it'd be Chris Bailey, the author um, who wrote the book that I got the inspiration from. I could do a interview with him either on my blog or if I have a podcast, I could interview him on there. Um, another thing I could do is a roundup of experts on how they get their big tasks done first. So maybe 
you know, really well-known people in the industry, maybe authors or people I look up to, like other marketing consultants or editors, and ask them how they get things done every day, and then do a roundup of their insight. That's a really cool way to get a collective basis of knowledge all in one piece of content. And it's something that you just have to do the organization of, and then the experts are happy to write the content and flush it out. So that's a cool way to kind of expand on your idea using outside knowledge. Another thing you could do, which I've done before, is do a roundup of popular books or resources on a related topic. So in our example, it'd be about productivity. Um, in the example that I'm showing on the slide, I write for a B2B marketing blog, and um, instead of, you know, this month, instead of doing um, another post about B2B marketing as a, from a strategy standpoint, I did a roundup of really great writing books and tools that B2B content marketers could use, and it did really well that month. It was one of the top uh, performing posts for that blog for the month, and so it was pretty easy to write, and it was just a roundup of resources, so people like looking at lists of resources um, because they're easy to read, easy to scan, and it might give them tools or books or blogs that maybe they wouldn't have known of uh, before. After that, you can grow your theme. So, you know, kind of expanding on the idea of junk food tasks or potato chip tasks. So, you know, I could do a webinar on how, you know, how we could focus on completing high-level tasks first. So that's, that's, that was the core concept of my article, you know, you want to do the big task first, but how can we do that? So growing my theme by doing a webinar about actionable ideas for actually being able to prioritize your task, um, I could include more statistics in the webinar. You know, it's always interesting to hear about, you know, a study done shows that people who check their email first in the morning actually get, you know, 30% less done than people who wait till lunch or the afternoon to actually check their email. So really cool statistics are going to help prove your point that it's important to focus on a high level task first or whatever the idea of your piece of content is. And then finally, um, webinar audiences really like hearing actionable advice and examples. So a webinar would be a really cool way for me to expand upon my original um, post and do a lot more examples. Uh, maybe I could do a day in the life of ideal prioritization and walk uh, my viewers through that during the presentation. And it's also, webinars are also a really cool way to interact with your audience. So just like you guys are now using our hashtag at CJ Think Tank, um, I could get ideas and feedback from my audience through my webinar, either through the chat box when they ask me questions, through live tweeting, maybe they reach out to me through email. Um, I feel like a webinar is a really immersive experience because it's happening live and people feel like they can ask you questions right away, which I know at Search Engine Journal we really love doing. So webinars are a great way to take a good piece of content that you're excited about and turn it into something that has more of a community feel with a lot, of, um, a lot more engagement from your audience. After that, you can start expanding your presence. So we're going to take my potato chip article and um, consider what we've done so far. So maybe we did an interview with Chris Bailey, we did a roundup of expert tips, um, and then I looked at the webinar in engagement and interactions that I had. Maybe people asked a lot of questions during the webinar that I hadn't thought of. Um, and so you could take all of that information and turn it into something even greater. So um, in this case, we could turn it into a long-form ebook about prioritizing your tasks. So, you know, junk food tasks was the core concept of my original post, and so the ebook is taking it into a, you know, a bigger version of that, a longer form version of that, and we're going to focus on task prioritization and how we can do that. And then uh, finally, you could create quotables that would be good for a PR campaign or a way to get featured. Um, you know, maybe using Haro, which is help a reporter out. Um, which you guys, if you haven't heard of it, it's free to join and it's a daily email list that comes out twice a day. Um, Danielle, if you could find the link and put it in the chat, that'd be cool. Um, it's basically reporters and bloggers looking for, uh, you know, information about things for articles. So if I had a list of quotes from my ebook, maybe maybe new research I had, maybe feedback from my experts uh, from my interview post, or quotes from Chris Bailey if I interviewed him. If I just had a list of those ready to go, um, they'd be great to use for PR outreach campaign and then also social media. 
So if I wanted to do a image that had, you know, statistics or key takeaways from my ebook or my original article, I could share those and images do really well on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest especially. So that's a cool way to kind of expand your presence on your existing social media profiles, but you're still using the content that you've been creating over this timeline. So going into that uh, more with the graphics, um, you know, I have my social media graphics that have, you know, the statistics or the quotes from experts, but I could also create an infographic that is a compilation of the statistics or key takeaways that I found. And infographics are great for sharing. Um, a lot of people use it as a link building tactic as well to get exposure on other platforms um, in a graphic format because it's a lot easier to share. Uh, infographics do really well on Pinterest. There's been studies that have found that longer graphics um, are, are obviously take up more space on a user's Pinterest feed. So they usually get a lot more engagement and repins and comments and likes, things like that. So maybe my infographic can talk about uh, key metrics within productivity as a whole, or I could get, again, narrow it down to focus more on tax pr task prioritization and how, uh, you know, a step-by-step -step visual method for prioritizing my tasks every day, maybe, you know, key concepts for to-do lists, things like that. So an infographic could be a good idea um, if you want to get into the visual side. And then another trend that um, I've been seeing a lot lately that, you know, Lauren actually mentioned as well when we did our run-through was taking blog posts and turning them into PowerPoint versions that then you can upload onto SlideShare. So if you look on SlideShare, here's a real example I found when I searched for productivity on SlideShare. Um, Steve Scott, he's a writer. He did a blog post that was about um, self-education, so, you know, taking online courses and stuff. He did a PowerPoint version of that. So he created a whole PowerPoint presentation that was key takeaways from his blog post, and so each slide um, had a tip from his original content. So that'd be a pretty easy way to uh, develop a different um, type of medium for your original content and then take it onto slide, your SlideShare account. Um, and SlideShares are really easy to embed so people could share them on their own site um, in addition to sharing them on social media, sharing the link. And SlideShare is also connected to LinkedIn. So you can now add SlideShare presentations to your personal profiles. So if you have a company blog that has featured writers, you could do um, SlideShare presentations for their greatest posts and then add them to their LinkedIn profile. So SlideShares are a really cool way, again, to uh, visually break down the core concepts of your content. With that, let's go into the next poll. Absolutely. Thanks, Kels. I'm launching the poll right now. So when you're, re when you're writing a piece of content, do you automatically think of ways you can repurpose it? Um, really simple, yes, no, or no, but that's why I'm here, uh, selections. So if everyone could uh, take a, a little bit of time and please answer the poll. We're already up to 60%, so it's a really engaged uh, crowd today over here at SEJ Think Tank. It, it must have something to do with it being May the 4th and your Star Wars theme, Kels. High energy, so, yeah. No. Um, it's the dark side of the force, actually. <laughs> uh, oh, 73% I have voted. I'm going to go ahead and count down. Um, let's try to get 80%. So if you haven't voted yet, please uh, check one of the uh, radio buttons. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'm closing the poll right now at 76%. Here are the results. Any awesome. thoughts? Yeah. So yeah, it looks like I'm glad you guys are here because you want to learn more how to break down content. So I really hope that I'm helping you so far. And um, it's good, too, that you know a third of you guys are interests are already thinking of it because it's a great way to build out more content with less uh, time and development. Cool. And back to you with the presentation. Thank you. So let's move on. It'll let me. So let's go into hyperspace. You know, we talked about your own profiles, 
you know, your own social media profiles, your SlideShare account, um, your webinar platform. But let's think about how we can connect with other universes to grow your content um, engagement and visibility. So, you know, are you exploring other galaxies? Are you looking at other platforms besides your own that could help you build your online presence? Let's talk about a couple with our case study. So uh, one galaxy that is pretty easy to travel to is syndication. So a lot of people are doing this um, already. A lot of brands are too because you can just connect your company uh, Twitter account with the Medium profile. Um, a lot of uh, thought leaders use LinkedIn Publisher. Anyone can use it now. So you can publish posts under your LinkedIn account and people get an alert whenever you um, that are in your network whenever you publish a new post. And so these are two really common ways that people are using for the syndication of their own content. So for example, I syndicated my potato chip article um, and I changed the title. So you don't always have to change the title if you're doing syndication. I just like to because it kind of mixes it up a little bit. So And it allows you to experiment if you don't have A-B title testing on your own site. Um, syndication kind of allows you to do that experimentation to see what gets more uh, traffic and views. And so if, um, if you don't want to do Medium or LinkedIn publisher, you could also syndicate on other industry sites. For instance, Search Engine Journal syndicates a couple well-known media and marketing websites like uh, Copy Press, WordStream, um, con Contently, we just started syndicating. So um, it's really important though on Medium and LinkedIn, you have a link to the original post at the bottom. Um, that's just kind of a, a hint to the readers that you know this isn't original content. And then if you're getting your content syndicated on other platforms, like if you were getting your blog syndicated on Search Engine Journal, you always want to do a, a canonical redirect. So it's basically um, a little code put into that page that is saying um, to the search engines, the original content really is here and it gives the link to the original content. So that's to avoid any uh, duplicate content issues that might arise on that front. So definitely uh, consider syndication if you haven't already. Another thing you can think of that I kind of touched on a little bit are other publishers and getting involved with them. So in this photo, these are just a couple of blogs I follow on Feedly. I subscribe to their RSS feed. Uh, Feedly does a really good job of allowing you to find applicable, applicable blogs based on keywords. Um, you can also follow lists from other users. So when I was searching, there was quite a few lists about uh, SEO that had SEO blogs, and you can follow them all at once. So I like Feedly for that. So what I could do is I could take you know, some of my favorite blogs that talk about uh, productivity, um, maybe Lifehacker, or again, Chris Bailey has a blog called The Life of Productivity. I could reach out to him, and I could do guest posts. So um, that would be different from syndication because I'm writing unique content for their, uh, their audience and their website specifically. And then maybe I could just ask for a link back to the original post, or if I have my ebook out on task prioritization, I could ask them if it'd be okay if I could include a download link or give it away to their readers for free. Um, so that's a cool way to get in front of a new audience that maybe hasn't heard of you, or in my case, has heard of the hustle life yet. And so I can expand my presence because I'm writing original content for these outlets, and it's so it's giving them more content, but then it's also allowing me to grow my thought leadership um, in this space of productivity and task prioritization. Another thing you could consider are podcasts. So if you don't have a podcast, I know in the first poll um, that's not as popular as video, like you guys said. Um, if you don't want to do a podcast, you could be on other people's podcasts. So for instance, Search Engine Journal, like I said earlier, has marketing nerds. I could maybe ask Danielle, who is our webinar manager and features editor at SEJ, I could ask her if she wanted to do a podcast with me um, about how we do our to-do list or how we pri prioritize our big tasks and walk through it. Um, so you could pitch you know, podcasts to be a guest. I know as a podcast manager, uh, me and Danielle are always um, every month looking for new guests to be on, and so we love getting pitches for new 
a new guest to be on. So you could pitch the podcast host and just say, you know, I want to talk about junk food tasks and how they disrupt your productivity, and then I want to give actionable advice on um, how to get through and finish your big project pro projects. I can't talk today. Um, early on in the day, so I'm more productive and get more done as a whole throughout my day. So if you are pitching podcasts, make sure you outline what you want to talk about, why it be beneficial to their audience especially, so they know that it's related, and then your background. So I could say, you know, my expertise comes from writing about productivity, but then I also practice what I preach because I have worked on my own um, full-time since 2010, and so I have over six years of experience on how to be productive and self-regulating in terms of getting things done. So that'd be sort of my little expert spiel um, that's going to qualify me to talk about these concepts. So another thing that I think a lot of people don't, talk, don't think about are conferences, and um, I don't think it's really thought about in terms of repurposing content, but I would urge you guys to give it a go. So, for instance, let's say I'm loving this idea of junk food tasks. I want to talk about it. I could pitch a presentation to an applicable conference. So I think in this case, business and marketing conferences might find you know, my strategies on how to prioritize your time and your to-do list interesting. So I could do a whole pitch on that. Um, and even if it doesn't get accepted, you know, the great thing about repurposing your content is that usually any content you create is salvageable and can be used in another way. So let's say I created my whole presentation, I pitched it to conferences and I didn't get accepted. I could um, record it anyway, you know, uh, record it on video and put it up on YouTube. Um, I could do a blab, which is a live streaming uh, presentation. I could put it on um, SlideShare things like that. I could do Facebook Live even and do a presentation. Um, I could do a webinar. So we that's what we've done at SEJ is um, whenever I've spoken at PubCon, you know, the first time I present my presentation has been at PubCon, but then maybe a couple months later I'll do it for our webinar audience. So I'm getting more use out of it. Um, you guys are hearing it that maybe um, you haven't heard it already. Um, and by the way, this presentation is just for the think tank. I, we don't reuse all of our presentations, but um, it's just a cool way to get more mileage out of the presentations and the content that you're already doing. Another thing that I could do, um, you know, when I was searching for this presentation, I didn't really see any conferences on productivity, so maybe I could start doing a conference series on that. You know, if I wanted to build a whole conference series on productivity that was in different locations, or if I, I could do a virtual conference um, that had experts that I've talked to and authors, and they could do presentations. So um, that's another way to expand your galaxy, expand your content past what you're presenting as well. So to wrap it all up, you know, may the fourth fourth be with you. Here's some key concepts to take with you as you go on your journey. Um, access outside knowledge. So get tips from experts that you can turn into blog posts. You know, do interviews with people that inspire the con the content that you're writing, and turn that into content uh, content either visually, audio through an interview, or more uh, text content on your blog. Uh, you want to grow your theme, so expand on the core idea um, through creating more content on your own profile. So, like SlideShare, like we must meant, like we mentioned, um, social media images, infographics, things like that. Next, you want to expand your presence, so take the content that you have and turn it into greater standalone content. So that goes into the long-form ebook that I mentioned that then I could maybe share on Amazon or create as a free download on my site. And then finally, think outside your own galaxy. So what are some other platforms that I could be on um, that maybe I haven't created a presence or a strategy for yet? So syndication, uh, guest blogging on other sites, um, pitching to speak at conferences, um, interacting with other sites to maybe get mentioned through uh, PR or quotable content, um, things like that. So with that, that's all I have for you guys today. So uh, I look forward to your questions, um, and you can connect with me on my social media. I'd love to answer any questions, even if we don't get to them during the webinar. Cool. Thanks, Kelsey.
Um, yeah. That was some really good stuff. And then one thing um, that I liked too was, you know, when people think of syndicating content, and you brought this up, a lot of folks only think of places like Medium and LinkedIn and other blogs. The fact that you can do guest spots and other podcasts, the fact that you can get on live chats, the fact that you can do some streaming video, um, not only does that give you a chance to syndicate, but like I'm a big fan of transcription, right? Because yeah. I feel like if you're having a conversation, like even our Q&A now will turn into, um, it's great for everyone that's, that's listening or everyone that plays the video, but taking key points from that, uh, writing them all down, whether you're using a transcription service or just doing it manually, is great because then you can really take some of the ideas that come up while you're having that conversation and turn those into blog posts themselves. So it's really this like cyclical <clears throat> concept of the more you can repurpose and converse around. It's like the Lion King, right? It's, it's like a circle of life, it's a circle of content <laughs> life. <laughs> and um, yeah. the more you can repurpose that content, the more you can have conversation around it, the more that actually spawns in the new pieces of great tips and content itself. Yeah, and that's a good idea. I don't know why we haven't thought of that before with our webinars is taking just the Q&A portion of all our webinars and getting it transcribed like you said. Um, we use Rev, by the way, rev.com to transcribe our podcast. <laughs> Uh, they're really cool. They're a dollar a minute for transcription. Um, they're not a sponsor. We just use them. But um, we could take the Q&As, like you said, and turn that into a piece of content by itself. So, you know, you guys are going to ask us questions um, that maybe we wouldn't have thought of and turn that, our answer and your questions into content, another blog post. So we should yeah, look into that for sure. Uh, I didn't even think of it, and there's there's questions yeah. coming in right now. So if you have a question for Kelsey, please be, feel free to uh, put it in the question box, and we'll review. But I didn't really think about it. But this Q and A is almost like an ask me anything, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you're you're on the hook for a half hour right now of answering questions. So if you have any questions whatsoever to ask Kelsey, whether it's um, about repurposing content, May the Fourth, or maybe that. Um, if you work really hard and be kind, amazing things will happen. Uh, picture <laughs> behind her, and uh, we'll get to it. So, but first, let's get uh, let's get to the questions that folks have already asked. Okay. Okay. Uh, wh what's the best way to repurpose content in an industry that's technical, um, but not necessarily visual, um, such as? Uh, well, insurance is the uh, example. So um, maybe uh, re repurposing content in a heavily regulated industry or repurposing content in, in um, something that's very, um, I don't know, written um, in terms of tips and instructions. Um, so one thing I'm, I'm, I started thinking of is you asked, um, since you asked me, is if you're doing content that is for you know training or for agents or maybe um, if you did insurance you know it could be for insurance agents that have offices all around um, if you have written manuals maybe it'd be useful to turn those into video explainers or video walkthroughs so if you have in, for instance um, a piece of software that you have a really long manual for you could do a visual walkthrough of the software and how to do certain settings or you know how to file a claim if it's insurance. I think that that'd be super interesting both for the agents, so the employees, um, or the even the people that are going to be interacting with you from a customer side. So even though you know you might not think of it as a visual industry, think about if if the concepts of your content could be explained easier through graphics or through video. Yeah, sometimes really simplifying things can, um, you know, not only help make it visual, but also make it viral. Um, for example, the first things that come to mind with me are like the IKEA and Lego instructions. Um, <laughs> they have. They no we need the pictures. Whatsoever. Yes, it's the only pictures are a lifesaver. It's turning something that's typically very uh, written into something that's very visual. Um, 
Next question comes from Margo. If, if you are mainly using content curation, what are some ways you can repurpose those articles that you find and share? Um, one thing that I've seen done um, that I really like, so if you're trying to build yourself up as a thought leader or um, if, you're, if your company is known as that, people want to know your opinion on things. So um, if you find a really cool piece of content that's really interesting or conversely, if it's something that makes you mad and you don't agree with, um, you could take that and take excerpts from it and then uh, write your own insights on it. So, you know, maybe Larry Kim, I, Larry Kim's my buddy, so he won't care if I use an ex him as an example. Let's say he wrote an article about how um, AdWords sucks and he's not going to use it anymore. I could take excerpts from his blog post, you know, so he has a statement and I put it as an excerpt in my blog post and then I write a paragraph explaining why I disagree. Um, that'd be a cool way to take content that's already been written by someone else and kind of turn it into your own because, you know, I'm citing Larry's article, of course, and saying when it's his, uh, his words, but I'm also taking my own spin on it and giving my expertise. Uh, so I've seen it done that way. Also, if you're trying to um, cover current events, something we do at Search Engine Journal is Danielle Antos, again, our features editor, she does a roundup of content marketing news for the month. And then Debbie Miller does our social media roundup. So they both take um, really interesting developments in those areas for the last month and then explain why it's important, gives the link in the title, and uh, why people should check it out. So that would be another cool way to tie in content curation and kind of make it your own. Yeah, I agree. I'm a um, huge fan of uh, roundups and wrap, like end of the week wrap up um, type thing. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it's one thing to just uh, list interesting stuff that's happened, but it's another thing to just take the time and comment on it. Because that comment that you make is, is original, right? It's almost like, exactly. you know, most of the time when you're watching the evening news, uh, they're just commenting on someone else's content, you know, uh, little <laughs> tips true. here, little tips there, and, and rewriting. So it's, um, it's very uh, similar. Um, okay, uh, next question. Uh, what is some good advice uh, for getting started on um, video webinars? Um, like what would be a good starting point? Um, and is it something that you have to perfect from day one? So I think what has helped the marketing think tank do so well is that we're super prepared. So we require all our presenters to do run-throughs, um, even if they're seasoned presenters. Um, to use Larry again, even though Larry Kim speaks all the time, we made him do a run through. Um, I think that that has helped a lot just preparing. Um, so I think you can learn as you go and figure out what works best, but being prepared makes a huge difference and it makes the presentation a lot smoother. So we have a script. Uh, so Lauren, you have a script over what you need to talk about during the webinar. We have those slides, you know, that pr are promoting certain things. This ending slide is something that we prepare ahead of time. Um, all the graphics are prepared ahead of time, like the promotional stuff. So maybe you guys saw a pop-up banner promoting this webinar on our site or on social media. Those things are all prepared um, on an ongoing timeline for our editorial calendar for webinars. I think that that part's really important. Um, in terms of getting started, it probably de depends on the resources you have. So, you know, we're a pretty big publication and we have a full-time graphic designer. So it's a lot easier for us to create a cohesive look and we use GoToWebinar, which is a paid platform. Um, but if you're a smaller business or you're not sure how you want to get started, um, you could use the free platform as well. So like Google has Hangouts on Air. Which, will work, which is live, and then you can record it, and then it automatically saves it as a YouTube video. So that'd be something to try out for free if you're not sure that you want to do webinars or you're just kind of testing the waters, but it also is pretty high quality, um, and people can chat with you and ask you questions. Um, Blab, which I mentioned, I think their website is blab.tv. Um, that could be another cool way to experiment with live streaming or webinars. So with Blab, you can have up to four presenters, and people can ask you questions in the chat, and you can share your screen, and that's all recorded automatically. And Blab saves it as an audio version and a video version, and it's currently free. 
Um, I don't know for how long it'll be free, but um, the original, it's actually an ideation from the original creators of Bebo, which was a social network back in the day. And so they've turned it into Blab, and it's really cool. Um, that'd be a cool way to experiment with webinars as well. If you're not sure, you want to actually invest a ton of money in it. Yeah, <clears throat> um, and just to add to that too, I mean, everyone has a starting point, right? Like, you know, you can, one thing I really like to do is look at some of the top blogs and websites out there right now and go into archive.org and see how they started. Because usually when they started, they were a hot mess. And then over time, what happens is people refine what they do. Like that's one reason that we have our audience survey at the end of every webinar we do is to make it better. When we first started doing these, uh, we were almost doing them in a Google Hangout style fashion where we had multiple people uh, going over and doing live SEO audits and things like that. Mm -hmm. One thing we found was that it didn't necessarily bring in the audience and engagement that was anticipated. So we, I hate to use the word, but we pivoted. We, we changed things and, and it's just constant refining and uh, making things better. I've even noticed that when we do our webinar, um, you know, some of the SEJ folks and some of our special guest sponsors will do things like make their background look like it's more of a set. So Page One Power, who's going to be doing the May 18th webinar on link building, uh, when they first started, you know, uh, they had their regular office background. Um, two more webinars in, there was a giant logo on the wall and back. And, and you know, the more we do with them, the more it's looking like a set. Um, even I know I'm a little bit more self-conscious in terms of like what my office looks like when I'm doing a webinar um, video. So, you know, it's just, it's really constant growth. And it's, it's almost like that with anything. So, you know, what I would say is like what should the starting point be is that the starting point is probably what you're more the most comfortable doing right now and then you just you rewatch your stuff and you get ideas um, and add to it. it. It's it's like that with anything. Uh, blogging, podcasts, webinars, whatever it may be. Um, <clears throat> next question from Camille is what are your thoughts on Periscope in general? And especially now that the archiving service uh, catch has ended. So in terms of Periscope, I think live streaming is going to become even more of a bigger deal, um, especially Facebook Live jumping on the bandwagon so you can live stream from your Facebook page. And um, I don't know if it's rolled out to everyone, but I can live stream from my own personal Facebook profile now. Um, I think it's going to start becoming even bigger than it already is. Um, in terms of repurposing your content uh, from that angle, um, it could be a cool way to talk about the article. So let's say I wrote a really um, controversial article and uh, a lot of people were talking about it. Maybe I could do a live stream with Lauren or Danielle or someone else from SEJ and we could talk about the article in real time, just the feedback we've gotten and uh, the developments. That'd be a cool way to utilize live streaming. Um, I definitely think it's a really cool way to get in front of an audience uh, in real time. Um, we're going to start using it for SEJ Summit as well, which is our conference series. We're going to live stream the Q&As from uh, speakers' presentations. So think about, but I, I would urge you guys to make it interesting. Like I on Periscope, I see a lot of things that I'm like, why are they live streaming this? It doesn't, I mean, it's, why should I watch this? So if you do decide, decide to live stream, um, it's important that, you know, you're doing it for the moment, which kind of speaks to your uh, question about the archiving. Um, anything you live stream, don't think about that you're doing it for pros posterity. You're doing it for the moment. Um, and usually those types of things help people jump on the bandwagon because they know, oh crap, I'm not going to see this again. Um, so I better join it now to see what's up. So I definitely would urge you guys, if you think live stream could benefit you, um, either through you know discussing concepts or you know, Q&A sessions, or if you go to a lot of events, um, live streaming those, I would definitely urge you guys to try it. Very cool. I haven't tried it myself yet, um, but I definitely will. I like, one thing I do like about Facebook is I'm typically not monitoring Facebook all day. 
Um, so if someone is doing a live stream on Facebook, I like it when they tell me beforehand, almost like you do when you're marketing a, um, a webinar. Um, yeah. But then at the same time, I like it that it's it's typically automatically archived, so I can like you know if Shoe Money or John Chow or Neil Patel or someone like that is doing um, a live stream, I can watch it later on at night um, when I'm not bothering anyone by uh, playing it. Um, very yeah, cool. I mean, you got to decide if the stuff you're covering, you want to save it or not, because, um, you know, maybe some, maybe your audience likes that, maybe they don't care and they won't watch it, um, but I, I, am, I am with you, I like watching stuff later, but I don't know if that uh, reduces the, the need for people to join right away or not, you know, I think it's still an emerging uh, you know, aspect of social media that we haven't quite figured out yet as marketers. So Andrew has an interesting question. Um, how does repurposing content impact lead generation? Well, I think it can grow your exposure for capturing more leads. So there's tons of opportunities for including a link to maybe a landing page or a contact form. So, you know, if you did a slide share, you could put it in the description box. If you did a YouTube uh, recording of your webinar, you could do a lead generation in the description box there. Um, in Facebook, you could do a link in the description if you did a, a takeaway image. Um, syndication, you could ask them, you know, some, some syndication public, uh, publish, publishers are a lot more free with the links. Uh, for us on SCJ, we just have the link to the original post, but maybe you could say, hey, it'd be really cool if we could also link to my landing page uh, where they can download my book, my ebook on task prioritization for free. Um, maybe they'd be willing to do that as well. Um, if you did do a webinar, you could link to the landing page in the chat box. So just like how Danielle will link to the sign up page for our next webinar, which is something we always promote at the end of every webinar. Um, that's lead generation for us uh, through the webinars that we do um, for the next one. So I think there's tons of opportunities to get more leads uh, the more platforms that you're on. Yeah, I've been kind of uh, thinking about that um, while you're going over. So, I mean, obviously from a webinar perspective, whenever we're doing a sponsored webinar, the sponsor has an offer, right, typically, that mm -hmm. they give out or send out afterwards. So when someone is attending the webinar and the sponsor does have an offer, um, basically you, you become a lead for that sponsor and you're entered into their you know marketing slash sales conversation funnel at the end of the day if you take them up on that offer. Um, also, you know, uh, with SlideShare, if you have a pro or paid account, um, you can get uh, lead information on people who download your presentation. Um, and want oh, to cool. contact you from that as well. And also, um, <clears throat> you know, just talking about lead gen, maybe on a personal level, uh, recently, well, not too recently, almost a month ago, I believe, LinkedIn launched ProFinder, which is uh, basically um, their answer to Upwork or, or freelance, or uh, sorry, uh, where anyone can, um, or Elance, where anyone can uh, basically offer their services via LinkedIn and you can hire people directly through LinkedIn for freelance type work. So if you think about it, by syndicating and becoming a LinkedIn influencer, by syndicating content on LinkedIn, LinkedIn on SlideShare, so uploading uh, your stuff to SlideShare, putting the SlideShare on your LinkedIn profile, you're really repurposing that content to build your presence within the LinkedIn network where then people can not just recruit you for a traditional job, but also hire you for an SEO audit or for a content marketing strategy or something like that. Like that's definitely the direction that they're going into, um, and they've gone into. And you know, just thinking of, of ways to really get an ROI on you know that repurposing um, can be as simple as really building up your LinkedIn portfolio. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's really cool. Um. I've seen a lot of people use Medium as well. I don't know the success rate, but uh, you know, tying in offers through the, out the content. So that's something we're experimenting with too on SEJ. If you look at our articles um, that we have, you'll see a little banner that promotes SEJ Summit, kind of to break up the content. You could do that with 
uh, you know, a lead gen offer as well, um, you know, that if the content's related to what you're going to offer, um, that could be an option too. Um, Candy would like to know, uh, if, if you're a small blog or a blog that's starting from scratch, what are some of the best platforms to start out with? Say maybe if you haven't you know, built up your name or following yet, but what are some of the smaller um, kind of low-hanging fruit for content repurposing or content syndication? I think it might depend a little bit on what your industry is, Candy, but um, I think if it's a blog about your life or you're setting yourself up as an expert, then definitely focus on the thought leadership aspect of it. Um, so you could do guest blogging. I mean, there's tons of blogs out there now, and everybody's trying to grow their presence. So maybe you could find a blog that has a slightly larger audience than yours and do a guest post for them and just kind of work your way up the ladder as you go. Um, continue to have uh, active social media. So you know, reshare your content. There's a couple of WordPress plug plugins that will. Um, and Edgar is a social media service. Um, that automatically re-adds your content to a social media queue that goes out. Um, so that's kind of a cool way to repurpose your content, not only by sharing it, but then you could also load up a queue of quotes or takeaways, like the quotables we mentioned, um, to share that on social. Um, I think just kind of looking for outlets that are a little bit bigger than you, um, and like I said, working your way up is a good way to get started if you're a new blogger to the industry. And more content is always better. So a lot of the successful bloggers that I've looked at, um, they're publishing several times a week, if not daily, and they just slowly grow their audience. And so you want to think about that too when you're new. Very cool. And uh, last but not least, um, Andy wrote in with a question. Um, if I and uh, if I've already s created a video series to educate home buyers, so I guess Andy is creating the video first. How can he then repurpose his educational videos? So almost taking the opposite approach. And he signed off with hashtag We're kind of a big deal. Wow, Andy. Um, so you could just do everything opposite. So you could get your video. Uh, series transcribed using a transcription service and turn it into long form content or an ebook. Um, you could break it down into smaller videos. So let's say you know one of your videos was about um, how to I don't know how to get a mortgage. Um, maybe it's an hour long video. Could you condense it into a five minute preview that gives just the basics or explains uh, you know, the things that you need to know and tie it into the longer form con uh, video content. Um, could you take stills? Maybe you could take stills from the videos and use that in your social media promotion. So if you're the one talking, there could be a still of you looking important and sharing a key concept, you know, and the text is on the screen. You could take a screenshot of that and share it on social. That's what we do to promote the webinars. Uh, Caitlin, our social producer, will take screenshots um, either of the presentation beforehand and schedule it out or as it's going live and uh, share it on socials. So that'd be something cool you could do from video as well. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the highlight reel, you know, um, taking some of the best moments uh, from that video or even some bloopers and uh, putting them on like, you know, five second, seven second videos for Vine and Instagram and Facebook that really capture that moment and, and want to get the person clicking on to watch the entire video or sign up to watch the video um, or whatever it is. I've also um, noticed that a lot of the uh, podcasts that I've been listening to recently will have like a highlight at the beginning of the podcast before they do their mm -hmm. intro. So it confused me at first, but I start listening to it and, and like everyone's laughing and I'm like, what, do I have to hit the rewind button? But then I realized that um, it's, it's a segment from the podcast itself, like the best segment. And then it, I listen to the podcast to get back to that um, moment of greatness because I want to yeah. see like what happened. And it's usually at the end. And it's also a good uh, trick for getting people to listen to your entire podcast is you know having that um, that great moment um, at the end or somewhere uh, near the end as well. 
Yeah, like little snippets of your content that you could per share to promote it that are going to pull people in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last question. I know, I know I said last before, but this just came in from uh, David. Uh, David asked, does an article's repurposing potential have a big influence on your content and editorial calendar? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, so from an SEJ perspective, it does to a point. Um, some content we write is just because we know that the written version will do the best because of how people search organically. Um, but if we have a topic that we know isn't going to cut it to have just a written post about, um, and, and we think about that as we're developing it, then we do keep that in mind and then maybe do a podcast episode about it or a webinar. Um, so I will say that it influences it, but um, you know, you also don't want to overwhelm yourself. So you know, it's better to write regularly high quality content and then turn some of them into other pieces versus putting so much pressure on yourself that every piece of content has to be something that's going to do awesome repurpose-wise. Um, I'd say it's better to get the content out there, get it rolling, and then figure out what you can repurpose and elaborate on versus you know being scared to do anything at all uh, for fear that you can't use it again. Very cool, very cool. OK, and speaking of repurposing content, um, after the webinar, we'll be sending out uh, the video of uh, Kelsey's presentation and the Q&A segment, along with a recap on Search Engine Journal. Um, and um, you can view the slides uh, from Kelsey's deck today on SlideShare. So those are three different um, ways that we've repurposed this webinar. Pretty amazing, right? <laughs> yes. Awesome. OK, and um, just to let everyone know, again, our next SEJ Think Tank webinar is going to be on May 18th. Um, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, it's going to be on link building campaigns, five foundations for success uh, from our um, partners and sponsor, Page One Power. So it's going to be Colby Stream from Page One Power um, presenting on May 18th about link building campaigns, five foundations for success. Um, also, if there's any questions that uh, you asked during the Q&A that we may have missed, we're going to be um, putting together answers uh, after the webinar and sending them out as well. So uh, thanks again, Kelsey. Yeah, thank you. I had a blast. Yeah. Happy Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with everyone. <laughs> and yeah. Great Ray Bond. Go, go watch your favorite Star Wars movie tonight to celebrate. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and please stick around for our survey after the webinar. Have a good one.